Let's talk about the slowdown in the oil and gas industry. After 10 years of seemingly successful shale drilling, why are companies filing bankruptcy? Why are their stock prices so low? Why are they having trouble accessing capital to drill more wells? Um, this is a really complicated problem. So we're gonna look at multiple different angles of it. And as a mineral owner, it'll give you a better idea of where the industry is right now, the problems they're facing, and what it's gonna to take to overcome this and get out of this downturn. So one of the most obvious problems is the overproduction of oil and gas. After 10 years of shale drilling with incredibly successful wells um, that are pulling so much oil and gas from the, from the ground, um, it's no wonder that oil prices are pretty low and natural gas prices are ridiculously low. And in fact, natural gas prices are really low because the infrastructure of the pipelines to get the natural gas out, which is the only way to get gas out really, um, has not been able to keep pace with the drilling. So especially in the Permian, um, you see a lot of companies that are flaring the gas um, because it's economical enough to produce the oil that the gas is such a, it's so cheap right now that it's almost just a byproduct. And they either have to pay somebody to put it in the pipeline or they need to flare it. And so they just flare it so that they get the oil to market. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little while and some of the ramifications of continuous drilling and overproduction. But this is definitely a factor that contributes. Um, if the price of commodities is really low, then even if you have these monster wells that are producing a lot of oil and gas, you're not really generating enough revenue um, from it. So another issue that's been uncovered recently is the parent-child well spacing problems. And this turns out to be a really big issue, um, much bigger than originally thought. So in a lot of these shell basins, you've got multiple layers of shell. Like in the Permian, you have you know, the Wolf Camp A, B, and C, and then you've got several other formations that you can drill in. And that means that you can drill multiple stacked laterals um, in, in one tract of land. And this is a really, really exciting prospect because if you drill one well and you assume that as, product, as, as much um, revenue as you get off of that well, that you can multiply that by you know, 12 or 24, or however many wells that you think you can put in there. Um, and you forecast your earnings based on very tight well spacing and assuming that each well is producing the same amount of oil and gas. And that leads to really big problems because what they found is that when you drill a child well and it's too close to the parent well, um, it, the child well's productivity is much, much less than what was anticipated. And you also affect the pressure for the parent well. And so the parent well is not producing as much oil and gas either. And these are, these are really, really big issues. So, um, you know, one solution is to drill the wells further apart with um, a larger ratio of parent to child wells. So you have less wells that you can fit in. Um, but they found too that if you just drill the wells at the same time, um, it, that's better than drilling a parent well and then a child well. Um, but not all companies have the finances to drill and complete multiple wells. So you kind of have this gold rush going on where everybody's trying to lease up the, um, the core, the tier one acreage. And, and in order to hold the lease, they need to drill at least one well. And so if you have the choice of drilling 10 wells and you're gonna drill you know, five of them in one tract of land and five in another, or, but then you're gonna lose all your other leases. So they've taken the strategy of drilling one well in each of their leases just to hold the lease and then come back and drill other ones. But that refining is not the, um, the most responsible way to develop a field. Another thing that's happened is referring to reserves versus drilling locations. So when you're talking about reserves, usually you're talking about proven 
probable or possible reserves. Proven reserves have a 90, at least a 90% chance of recovering the oil and gas. Probable has a 50 to 89% chance. Probable, actually that was probable. Um, possible is a 10 to 48% chance. So there's a huge difference between having a 90% chance in proven reserves and having you know, a 10 to 48% chance in possible reserves. But what's happening is sort of to hype up um, the amount of acreage you have and your future production in order to affect stock prices or to gain access to capital. Companies have talked about drilling locations without specifying whether it's proven reserves, probable reserves, or possible reserves. And so this, this is misleading, um, and it's especially misleading if you use drilling locations and then you try to estimate and forecast how much production and revenue you're going to get off of those drilling locations. And then we have the push for growth versus profitability. So Wall Street has really pushed the oil, oil and gas companies to grow. And they have really wanted to go out and lease as much as they can, especially in core and tier one acreage, and um, drill as many wells as they can just to grow as fast as they can, to have more revenue, more reserves, um, and to forecast more future earnings. But this is causing companies to drill wells in areas that would not normally be economical. And in fact, they're still not economical, but they're drilling them because that is the treadmill that they're on. Um, to drill another well, to access the revenue from the first year of revenue, basically, and then um, to get more money to drill another well. And it's this, it's a rat race that you can't get out of. And it's causing big problems. So now we're starting to see the focus shift and companies are focusing more on profits and playing a longer game rather than just drilling for the sake of drilling and revenue. So the majors have always had the strategy of playing the long game. They've been around for decades and they will be around for decades probably. Um, and that's because they're really, they're playing the long game. They are looking at a field and they're trying to develop it in a way that may take time, but will extract the most hydrocarbons from the ground. And if you contrast that with the excitement over shale drilling and how many new players got into this space, um, a lot of them came in with this idea of having an exit strategy. Like we're gonna go in, we're gonna buy everything we can, we're gonna drill as much as we can, and then when the wells are producing, you know, their first few months or year of production is, is the highest. And so then they want to turn around and flip the company to the next biggest guy. So you've had a lot of that. Um, and it causes this flip or this find and flip or pump and dump mentality. Um, there was even one company that used the extra day of daylight savings time to get their revenue numbers up to a certain amount and their production um, so that they could flip it. There's just, there's a lot of stories out there. And it's not, it's not a long-term growth strategy and it's not a long-term, it's just not, it's not playing the long game. And in order to survive in the oil and gas industry, which has its ups and downs, you've got to plan for the downturns and you have to, you just have to play the long game. So what now? The oil and gas industry is sort of having a come to Jesus moment. Um, they're really having to realize that they need to play the long game. They need to develop a field economically um, and focus on profits. And is it a good idea to drill a well here rather than can I get money to drill a well here? Um, so there's a lot of factors at play. Um, there were overvaluations and parent-child spacing problems. And the industry as a whole is gonna to have to solve all of these problems. And they are well aware of it. And I think that really there are a lot of companies that are working on 
solving these issues and playing the long game and looking at profitability instead of growth. So I don't know how long it's going to take to come out of this downturn. There are always downturns in oil and gas. And we have just come out of 10 years of incredible innovation and growth. I don't know that oil and gas has ever seen um, something like what we've just been through with the shale revolution. So the fact that there is so much oil and gas being produced right now makes me think that this will be a, a long downturn. But you know, we don't really know. Um, I don't really see oil and gas prices recovering, um, especially not the natural gas, which is below $2 an MCF now. And even when we get export um, infrastructure in place, it doesn't look like that's actually going to help that much either. So I think we may be in this downturn for a while. And as a mineral owner, you have the option of just holding out, which is probably the most advisable option. If you don't have to sell your minerals and you don't need access to cash, then you know hold on to it. But um, not everybody's doing that because there are still a lot of people who don't realize um, the significance of the slowdown. And there are a lot of minerals that are overvalued still, especially in the Permian and some of the other shell plays. And so if you sell your minerals, you can still get you know, a reasonably high price for them. Um, so some people are choosing to sell before the, because you, know, you know, the revenue checks are just declining. And um, so selling sooner rather than later, um, if you're going to sell, is somewhat advisable. So if you'd like an offer on your minerals, go ahead and uh, request an offer from Blue Mesa Minerals. You could just go to the website and we'll be happy to look and see what you have and give you an offer.